Since the dawn of humanity, scientists and engineers have tested the boundaries of possibility. And by possibility, we mean robots. Robots are not just part of Star Wars and the Terminator. They have been around for millennia. In Alexandria, mechanical marvels flourished. And the Ptolemies, the pharaohs, loved to use them. They had huge statues with moving parts that breathed fire and blinked their eyes. They had dragons that spit water. Arabic scholars and engineers created mechanical wine servants. They had programmable musical fountains, all kinds of things. And they gave these objects as gifts to foreign rulers. When these gifts came to European heads of state, rulers like Charlemagne, the people were terrified because the only way they could think of that these things would work was by demons. The thought of using demons to create technology was enough to turn the average knight in shining armor into a freshly shorn sheep. But when it came to robots, they made an exception. In fact, to the typical European nobleman of the time, the possibilities of demon tech were endless. I could create golden knights to guard my castle, copper musicians. However, if history has taught us anything, it's that the demons make horrible engineers. So the Europeans decided they would be better off building robots all by themselves. The Count of Artois said, I am going to build these things in my own castle. The castle was called Aden, and he did. He built an enormous pleasure garden with musical fountains, marionettes in the shape of monkeys that made lewd gestures, shall we say. But even lewdly gesturing monkeys couldn't quell the European appetite for automata. A few hundred years later, the Duke of Burgundy left behind an itemized bill for ADA 2.0, complete with upgraded robots. Three automata that spout water and wet people at will, a machine for soaking ladies when they tread upon it, an entrance to the gallery which, when you touch the knobs, strikes those who are underneath in the face and covers them with dirt or flour. At the exit of the gallery, there is another machine and all who pass through it will be struck and cuffed about the head and shoulders. If in fact you tried to leave, you would be beaten by other robots wielding swords. And my particular favorite are, I'm quoting directly here, numerous devices to soak the ladies from below. Unfortunately, the robots of the ancient world never did satisfy our ancestors' quest to control autonomous beings. After all, what fun is bossing around a robot with a spring system when one could command large groups of people with only the wave of a hand? Who has the power to heal? To heal the sick? To heal the mad? To heal the deeply disturbed? Well, someone named Anton Mesmer, a Frenchman in the 18th century, said, I know how to deal with this problem. What's going on is actually a misalignment of the animal forces in the human body. What I'm going to do is I'm going to help nature along. I'm going to move these animal forces around. I'm going to take this animal magnetism and I'm going to fix it so I can cure the blind. I can prevent hysteria and I can deal with this problem. Better books about animal magnetism. The discovery of animal magnetism by Franz Mesmer or Kenny Rogers America by Kenny Rogers. I think we all know the answer to this one. That's animal, that, look at that beard. Through hugely visual displays and hugely popular approaches, he took his powers, he realigned the animal magnetism within the body and seemingly he cured people either on the individual level or people in groups. He would take an object, a round tub called a baquette, he would mesmerize it, you would touch it, and you would be cured. Now, of course, not everybody believed this, right? The French king appointed a commission to investigate it. On this commission, the foreign body was our very own Benjamin Franklin. And what the commission was tasked with was finding out if Mesmer had really discovered a new fluid. Through a blind experimentation protocol, they investigated, and they found that there was no new fluid. Benjamin Franklin served on a commission that discredited mesmerism while living in Paris, or lived in an invisible house and drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and we wonder why Franz Mesmer has the tarnished reputation. But why stop at mesmerizing large swaths of the populace when science provides grounds to also subjugate half of them?
The Descent of Man, uh, Charles Darwin's work on human evolution, was published uh, in 1871, which is 12 years after the origin of species. The main mechanisms that he thought were important in the evolution of the higher mental and moral faculties were natural selection and, above all, sexual selection. Darwin argued that men and women possess very different mental qualities. No one disputes that the bull differs in dispossession from the cow. So women surpass men in tenderness. The wild boar from the sow. In intuition. The stallion from the mare. Rapid perception and selflessness. These faculties are characteristic of the lower races and therefore of a past and lower state of civilization. They're inferior in energy. Women seem to differ from men in mental disposition. Courage, ambition. The chief distinction is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can woman. And if we rewind a few hundred years, history shows us that Darwin's words resonated just as truly in the Middle Ages when man decided that woman was the source of a major witch problem. Trials for witchcraft varied immensely from place to place around Europe. If you were an accused witch, you were much better off in Italy or Spain or central France. Uh, if you were in the Alpine regions, you were pretty much in trouble. The defendant is accused of the charge of witchcraft! Then again, in Renaissance Venice, when accusations of cavorting with Satan were more common than gondolas, man, in true Darwinian fashion, actually used his superior reasoning abilities to separate false accusations of witchery from the ones with real merit. They were, in fact, a court with a lot of procedure. Please state your full name and current place of residence. Dorothy, Dorothy Gale of Kansas. So to avoid convicting someone wrongly, the inquisitorial headquarters told the local tribunals they had to be very, very careful with the evidence. There are many things that can cause such a plume of smoke to appear. Swamp gas, for instance. Uh, don't go on reputation alone, they said. Rumors abound about, quote, old and ugly women because of the hysteria that surrounds witchcraft. Don't accept stories of demonic parties in the middle of the night out in the woods. Uh, demons can delude people. You might think that you saw your neighbor there, but maybe it was just a demon in disguise. Uh, instead, the Holy Office of the Inquisition in Rome told local tribunals, you need medical experts, you need physicians. Call a surprise witness! I am here today to testify, free from coercion, that Dorothy Gale from Kansas is a witch. <sighs> On one occasion, when she fell asleep in a field of poppies, she used a dark magic to conjure snow that woke her from her slumber. Also, she wears magic shoes that she stole from a dead person that she dropped a house on. <laughs> but in his Darwinian quest for eminence, man eventually moves away from the notion that the devil and his witches are the driving forces behind humanity's ills. And in 1793, few cities were more ill than Philadelphia. Summer in Philadelphia, 1793, was hotter than I'll get out. You just gotta believe me. You couldn't get a water ice, they hadn't invented readies. And then people started turning yellow and dropping dead. That's right, Philadelphia languished in the unyielding grip of yellow fever, and people were dying by the hundreds. In a letter to his wife, renowned physician Benjamin Rush, writes that according to some of his contemporaries, there was a far more likely suspect than witches or demons. My enemies like that scoundrel Alexander Hamilton and his Federalist friends believe the fever to have been imported from afar, probably from the French. <laughs> Around this time, Rush was pioneering the use of 18th century medicine rather than spellcraft to cure the sick hastening the deaths of hundreds of his patients. And he had wild treatments, like bloodletting and strong pills, and mercury for a gentle opening of the bowels, a gentle, a gentle opening of the bowels. <laughs> yes, opening of the bowels. 
Though many in the Philadelphia medical community libeled and slandered me, it was I who was in the trenches treating the citizens of Philadelphia. And it was I who knew that bloodletting, mercury, and purging was the best way to treat and cure yellow fever. And I can personally attest to the wonders of my treatment. I fell sick during the Great Plague, and here I am 200 years later talking to you. <laughs> Rush and his contemporaries believe that there was twice as much blood in the human body than actually existed. And he, <laughs> for it. And he believed that he could bleed up to four-fifths of that volume of blood. <laughs> you can do the math. So as I look at your smug face, Thanks for joining us on this trip through time. While so many of these theories seemed right at the time, modern technology has provided us with evidence of the contrary. To find more events like this one, visit philasciencefestival.org or visit us at the Philadelphia Science Festival this April.